Hey everyone, welcome to this video on systemd services for Mule. We're going to be looking at how to create a systemd service unit that will let us control our Mule instances. And this guide is going to just give us a quick crash course on setting up the systemd unit file and the items that we might need to make Mule run. Just to give you some idea of how this was inspired, a lot of times we see groups that are using sys5init or just even going into the mule bin directory and starting the mule directly, all kinds of wonky ways to get mule started and control their mule instances. But when you look at it, systemd is really becoming the primary init system for a lot of Linux distributions. Many of them, including Ubuntu, have even migrated over from ones like Upstart and so on. So if you are brand new to init systems, don't fear, this will have some pretty easy pieces in it that I think anybody can grasp. Think about it as this being a means of you controlling your mule process just like other processes would on a Linux system. And this being a way for you to not only start them in a consistent manner, but ensure the way that mule starts is consistent, right? Because who knows what user that person's logged in as when they start mule and so on. The systemd unit file is going to define a lot of those things. We can also set up things like dependencies for what the mule process needs to have up and running or needs to start running once it starts. We can do things like specify its available resource footprints, how much memory it has available to us, how much processing power, if we wanna bind it to a single core and so on. And then even do things like have Mule run on startup, maybe set up some timers that will kick off the Mule systemd process. And there's lots of cool advanced features like setting up a system where a socket connection or a new connection to the server actually kicks off the, the Mule process. And as we go through, we're going to look at, again, how to set up that unit file that's going to define how to control Mule through systemd, and I think you're going to find it pretty straightforward. As always, you can head to octets.com and see a guided version of this same content. One thing that I'm going to make the assumption of is that you do have a Mule instance available to you. And if you aren't sure how to go out and get a Mule standalone instance, in this case, I'm going to be using the community edition, you can hop to the octets.com site and read the section for prepare the Mule instance. I'm going to make two primary assumptions. Again, the first is that you have a Mule instance somewhere on your Linux box. And secondly, that you have a user that we're going to be able to use for this process. In my case, my user is going to be called Mule, and we're going to start off right from there. So first thing to get started off with is just taking a quick look at our Mule itself. So if I come into the op directory, and that's effectively where I've unpackaged my Mule server, you'll see that I have a Mule standalone instance inside of here. You'll also notice that it's currently owned by root. Now, there's a lot of permission things that I probably do here to make sure that the specific folders and things of that nature are protected. But for simplicity's sake, I just wanna make sure that the user that's going to be capable of running this is in fact the Mule user. So we'll start this off with just making sure our permissions are okay. I'm gonna recursively change the ownership of this Mule standalone 3.8.1 to use Mule Mule. I'll have to sudo this since I am logged in as myself. So throw my password in here. All right, and if we look again, now Mule Mule owns this. And if I were to go in and try to say start the Mule instance as such, it is going to fail on me due to permission issues. So that is the initial setup that we're going to need. I am gonna go ahead and log in as root because a lot of these commands, at least on how my machine's set up, I will need to be root anyways to set them up. So first things first, we need a unit file. And think of this like the descriptor that tells system D about how Mule should run, how to stop it, all that good stuff. So first things first, we can go into the opt or the Etsy directory rather, systemd system directory. And you can hop online. In fact, I've got a link in the Octet site about a Red Hat documentation page that I think describes these places pretty well. There's a, there's a couple places for more like ephemeral, uh, ephemeral units and, and things of that nature. But this area, I believe they describe it as the place where system administrators would add their, their unit service files. So inside of here, Etsy systemd system, we're gonna make a file called mule.service. And now we have a mule service file. And of course, we're gonna start editing the various sections. Now, the systemd docs are really good in the sense that you can go in and really figure out exactly what these different sections are. To give you a, a quick example before we start creating our own, let me just go in and open up a browser real quick 
and I'll show you the system D unit section. Now this is also from their site, basically a printout of the man pages in a way. We could go in here and grab system D unit and do man system D dot unit and effectively get the same information. But I do find the web page quite convenient. If we come inside of here, we will learn a little bit about the different sections that we can create. In particular, one of the first sections that we'll be creating, which is the unit section. So again, feel free to come in here and dive deeper into a lot of the different parameters that are available. I'll be covering a tiny, tiny subset of them. So getting started, I'm gonna go inside of Etsy system D, system mule service, that new file we just created. And at the very top, we're gonna to start off with a, in fact, let me just quickly make sure that I am back as my root self here before we go much further. System mule service, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna start off by defining the unit section at the very top. Unit section has two baseline parameters that are quite common, there's many more, but one is the description of what this is, and this will help us in our logs and things of that nature. I'm gonna call this the Mule Runtime 3.8.1, since that is the version of Mule, the, again, the community Mule that I've downloaded from the web, and documentation. And documentation, if you read into the docs, you can put things like a man reference here, you can put an HTTP reference here. In my case, I'm just gonna link out to the docs.mulesoft.com. Since there's not necessarily a man page for Mule, I'm going to use this as the reference point for the docs. Now, this will be my baseline unit description and will provide me with some context around, again, what this process is and what I'm gonna be controlling with system D. Now the next section, and arguably the most important one, is the service section. And if you have used anything like Sys5 init, I think it'll be very nice how, how clean this looks, if you will. Um, although some might, some might argue that point a little bit. In the service section, we're gonna describe things about the process, what it is, who should run it, how to start, stop, and restart that process. First thing we're gonna do is specify the type of process. And if you look, go into the unit docs, once again, you're gonna find information about these various types. We're gonna use forking, which on a high level is going to say that the parent process that gets kicked off by this is going to die, but this is going to be a separate process that it then kicks off, which is exactly how Mule is going to work because that initial Mule binary used loosely here, really shell script, right, is going to kick off the wrapper, which will be a process, which will then kick off the meal runtime. And the reason you want to use forking here and can't just leave it as a default is there will be a sig term signal that is going to be sent out from system D when this uh, completes. And what I found is that sig term signal will get caught by the child process, aka mule, and mule will actually shut itself down when it sees that sig term. So rather than modifying the wrapper for mule or mule in general to not grab that sig term or capture it and just ignore it, I think it's far more appropriate to keep it as a forking type. Next up, we have the user, and the user in this case is going to be the mule user. Again, that is the user I showed you that I had created, and you can see details on how to create a user like that on octets.com. And then we're gonna set up a couple different execute commands. So we're gonna have execute start, we're gonna have execute stop, and then execute reload, which as the names imply, what should system D do when you are requesting that the process gets started and is controlled by system D? What should it do when it is stopped and should be shut down from system D? And then lastly, reload it, or, or in other words, restart it. Now this is actually pretty simple for us from a mule perspective, because we can basically use the same binary file. If I come in here and grab the op directory mule standalone 3.8.1, which is the directory inside of opt, in there, there will be bin, and then inside of there, I'm going to have my mule binary. And those of you who have used mule know that you can simply place the command at the very end of it. So in this case, this will be the command that guides the starting process of mule, just like that. Now I'm going to go ahead and grab that command and of course bring it down here. All right. And then for stop, we'll of course do stop. And mule of course doesn't say reload, it instead says restart. So our service is a forking type, the user that will run it is mule. And then for executing start, stops, and reloads, we have provided the specifics around what should happen inside of here. Now, lastly, we're gonna add one more section inside of here, and this is the install section. You're gonna see a little bit later why install is important, but just to give you a high level overview, this is going to allow us to 
enable the unit as systemd calls it and and most commonly by enabling it what we're going to be doing is adding it to this target where if the system is starting up there might be a target that the system initiates and if mule is part of that target then mule will start up on system startup so if you were to have a server outage you'd of course want mule to start back up when the server starts up and this would be a method of doing that so basically we say what target this is wanted by again it'll become a little bit more clear later for now we're going to put in multi user dot target okay and i'll show you exactly what this translates to very shortly so we've got our unit file we've got our service file and we've also got the install file defined inside of here and believe it or not this is a decent base system d script for mule so we'll go ahead and exit out of that now the next thing we need to do is use a tool in systemd called systemctl and systemctl is basically the controller that you're going to be using to make not only changes to these unit files but also reloading them starting them stopping them getting details on them and so on now the first thing that we are going to notice with systemctl is if we go and do systemctl and we run the command for list units okay it'll give us a bunch of different units inside of here in fact Previously, I had a meal service in here. If you did list units, it's quite likely meal service would not even show up. I had ripped mine out for the sake of this video, and now it's saying it's not found. So whether it's not found or simply not in this list at all, it basically means that our command here, systemctl, is not aware of that unit file. Now, what we can do here is we can reload the daemon using systemctl daemon reload. And if we run systemctl daemon reload and we do systemctl list units again, you're going to notice that it is now loaded. Don't worry too much about the failed pieces just yet. Um, that will be resolved a bit later, but they, it is at least loaded and available to us now. So systemd is aware of this. Let's see if we can start mule using systemctl. So I'll go inside of here get systemctl ready. I'm going to say start mule. Another thing I'm going to do inside of this directory is go ahead and let me just clean this top window up here real quick. Okay, systemctl, again, that's start mule. All right, and in this bottom directory here or terminal window, I'm going to go in as the I believe I could just view the files as my user because I haven't changed permissions. So let's see here. I'll just go into my mule folder and I'll tail out the logs directory and specifically the mule log file. Okay, so at the moment mule is not running and I'm going to try to trigger it using systemctl start mule. So I will start it up. And now you can see systemctl is kicking off the mule instance and now the mule instance is up. So depending on who I'm logged in as, assuming I have access to use systemctl and start this process, I know it will consistently start up in this fashion. Another really nice thing is I can continue to use the tooling in systemctl to get information about my process. So if we say status mule inside of here, there's a couple things that we'll notice. First off, we can see what the unit was that was loaded. We can see that it is active or is running and when it was last started. We can see the initial process 9975, which would be the actual startup script, if you will, that was kicked off. And then something that's really cool and easy to control through system D are the C groups. So C groups have this notion of slices, and this is kind of like a tree of processes and child processes. One of the things that we notice here is the main process has exited, which we actually expect. That's that mule start script. But the PIDs for the wrapper, which is what the tool that, or the piece that wraps mule and starts it up is 10 or 10056. And then the actual mule Java process that the wrapper is started up and monitoring is 10059. So we can get some basic information around CPU, memory, tasks, and all the different details about when the process was started in a very clean and consistent manner. Along with a little bit of an output log around when systemd started it, what mule reported back to systemd, and when it got its, as it calls it, kind of startup verification or startup signal that systemd got brought back up to it, knowing that it could then kill off this main process inside of here. So taking this a step deeper now, let's go ahead and stop our mule instance. So I'm going to do systemctl stop and of course provide mule so it actually knows what to stop and now the mule is going to shut down using that same command 
So again, a very easy way to come in as an administrator, as a user, and start and stop these instances and get details on them. Now, the next thing that I wanna go ahead and do here is I wanna make sure that Mule can start up when the system starts up. So what we can do is we can use systemctl once again, and this time enable Mule. Now what's going to happen when you enable Mule is it's actually gonna create a symlink inside of the multi-user wants target, okay? And you can look up some documentation. I know Red Hat has some good details on what multi-user means and, and kind of what phase in the startup cycle that relates to. But for keeping it simple and, and maybe oversimplifying it a bit, multi-user target is going to be a place where when the system starts up and it gets to a certain point where it's starting to bootstrap and get the system set up, it is going to trigger this target in which Mule is now part of it. And multi-user.target has this wants directory where it knows what other units it wants to start up. If we look inside of etc or etsy systemd system, multi-user target wants. You can now see a couple processes I have in here. In my case, I've got network manager, remote file system, and mule service. So these are all going to be started up when the system starts up. Now, I'm not gonna show you this in this video, but you're more than welcome to pause and try this out yourself. If we do do systemctl and check the status on mule, I can see that it is clearly loaded but inactive. If I were to restart my machine right now, when it starts back up, the mule server should actually be running automatically. And if I ever wish to turn the mule server off again from being a startup item in that multi-user target, then I can just come in here and say, disable mule in which, as you could probably guess, now inside of Etsy system D, system, multi-user wants, Mule is no longer there. So when this target triggers, that unit is no longer going to start. So it's really that simple to enable and disable Mule as effectively a login or a startup item. All right. So now that we've set up Mule as a startup item and we have looked at starting and stopping Mule, seeing some status and details about Mule, let's talk just a little bit more about what else Systemd can offer us and why you might consider putting Mule inside of Systemd or rather use Systemd to control the Mule instance. So there are a lot of config options that you have out there. One of the more particular ones, or I guess more common ones, is you have the ability to actually specify the resource footprint available to your Mule instance. So if I just open up a Chrome window one more time here, all right, and go to the systemd resources area, there are tons and tons of information about how you can specify IO, CPU, memory, all these different pieces and all the parameters that you can specify in your unit file are inside of here and described in some very good detail. So let's play around with just a few of these and also use a tooling that systemd offers us to kind of top or look at the usage of our processes live. So first thing that we're gonna do here is head into our, our systemctl edit mode. So I am going to go back into the sudo access here and get into my root user for a moment under the assumption that I can type the password incorrectly. Okay, third time is a charm. There we go, okay. Now, if I go in and do systemctl and edit the mule service file, what this will typically do if I just hit enter here is it's actually gonna open up an override. You can see that in the bottom here and you can read about overrides in systemd's docs. Overrides are a way for you to kind of override settings in an existing unit file. But in this case, I really don't wanna do an override. I'd actually like to edit the primary systemd file. So to do this, we can go in and run that same command, but add the full flag inside of here, which is going to bring us into the actual unit file that we had created initially. Now we're in edit mode, just like we would be if we had gone in in Vim or Emacs or whatever, use some editor to get into this file. Inside of service, let's specify some parameters. Specifically, let's do a simple one that we can observe, which would be CPU quota. So CPU quota is going to allow me to specify how much processing resources this Mule instance should have available to it. With 50%, I'm going to be binding it to half of the core, and I can go over 50% to, you know, say 200%, allowing Mule to take up two of my cores if I were to choose to. But this will be a really simple way for us to see Mule start up, hopefully a little bit slower because it's going to be limited in its CPU, and also monitor the CPU usage of Mule at a given time. 
So what we'll do here once we've made the CPU quota change is save this up. Now, one more mention that I will make about system CTL edit. Again, we could have gone into the systemd folder and we could have very easily just edited this file as well, but systemd edit actually reloaded the daemon automatically. So we do not have to run system CTL daemon reload. It already is gonna be aware of those changes that we had made. So once again, let me go ahead and tail out those mule logs. So that will be in opt mule logs mule.log to show that and have that get started. Another thing that I'm going to do inside of here, I guess in this top window, it'll make a little bit more sense. I'm going to start up a process called CG top or control group top. This tool system D system D CG top is going to provide us with a way to very easily look at our different control groups that system D is running and see where allocations of resources are being used. So I'll do system D CG top and inside of here, see if I could expand this just a little bit to make it a, uh, there we go. So we can see all the processes. We can see some of the things that are going on. So my whole system, it's got this 51, 57 ish CPU percentage being used. I can see a lot of that is being used in this user slice here. And again, these slices are almost like a tree like structure where we can see what exactly and control what exactly these processes have available to them as far as resources go. So I'm going to keep this running as we start up the mule instance and I'll keep the logs down here as well. So as we know, we can start up the mule instance using system CTL start mule and we will kick it off. Now, two things that we should observe. One is that it should go much slower down here. We shouldn't see it so instantly start itself up because it is limiting itself and mule is going to take up a decent amount of processing power when it first bootstraps the JVM and all that good stuff. Along with this taking a bit longer to start up, we should be able to look into this mule service. And if you look closely as it's moving around here, it should stay in the ballpark of 50% CPU usage at any given time. You'll notice that it spikes around the high 49.9 range, but then kind of stays in that area, maybe just barely going over 50 at a given time. So as mule is starting up here, we are constraining this instance of mule to only that amount of processing power, which is nice because what if we have other services on this server? What if we have maybe multiple mule instances on the server that we want to make sure each of them have their own specified control group? And again, this is really just scratching the surface. The power of what you can do with systemd almost feels limitless. You could go inside of here and you could schedule more than what would be available at a given time, but have priority levels where certain processes that are scheduled can have a higher priority to utilize their available resource footprint over another service that you might be controlling with systemd as well. So now the server has seemingly started up. In fact, I think it may still have a couple more pieces that it's initializing because Mule is still up in this higher 50% range as it's beginning. We should see Mule drop down once the service starts up successfully. And the last thing I'll mention is the system slice Mule service, just to keep this in mind, if we go to system CTL status Mule again, that is composed, that slice is composed of both the wrapper process and the Mule Java process. So Using the slice system, we are able to apply our settings to both of these processes. And now that Mule has seemingly started up, if we come back, we can see its CPU has dropped down significantly because it's just in an idle mode now that the application has started successfully. All right, so again, another really cool example of things that you can do with system D. Let's just take one more example, a little bit redundant, but cool to see nonetheless. Let's assume that we want to limit our memory usage now, just to show you how easy this is. If we go in and go to, once again, system CTL, system CTL edit mule service full, we'll get back inside of our service unit file and we'll head into memory max. So this is gonna be an upper bound to how much memory the process is allowed to have. If it continues to exceed it and systemd cannot keep it below that level, it will have an out of memory exception or, or some type of out of memory signal happen. And what we'll do here to start ourselves off is limit ourselves to five megabytes, which anybody who's used Mule should know that that's not gonna be enough to start Mule up. So to demonstrate this and just to show the limit, we'll set it really low just so you can see it take effect. 
Now with the memory max of five megabytes inside of the service area, let's go ahead and also specify a timeout here. SenseMule is not gonna be able to start itself with five megs allocated, so it'll be a good time to set timeout sec where we can see if 15 seconds pass during startup, the system D process will shut down Mule instead of starting it because it did not satisfy giving it, or it being system D, giving it a successful startup signal before that 15 seconds was achieved. Another nice thing about this parameter is it applies to both timing out from a startup perspective and from a shutdown perspective. So what system D is going to do is if you signal that you want the process to shut down and in 15 seconds, it does not successfully get that shutdown signal, it is going to go ahead and determine that it needs to send a sig kill to the process. That way, it's not just getting hung up indefinitely and sitting there in a state where the server is trying to shut down. System D can actually contain it and say, it's been too long, I'm shutting you down forcefully, let's do this. So we've got the timeout sec of 15 set in place. We'll go ahead and save that up. Now for this last demonstration, what we can do here, in fact, let me do it vertically, it'll be a little bit easier here, is we're gonna go ahead and run system D CG top again, just to see our processes running. And what we effectively should see here when I try to start the service is after 15 seconds, it should fail. And we should also see that five megabytes is the limiting amount of resource available to memory. So we'll go to system CTL, we'll start system CTL, and we will do mule.service inside of here. Now, first thing we'll notice is when mule service pops up, you can see it has about 4.9, 4.6 megs assigned to it. And if you look to the left here, it should time out in just about 15 seconds from the point that I hit enter, and there it is. So job mule.service failed, timeout was exceeded. As you dive deeper and deeper into using Mule, one last thing that I'll, or using System D with Mule, I should say, one last thing that I'll mention is that it'd be really valuable for you to learn a little bit about journal CTL and how it handles logs and your ability to read information. And just to give you one quick example, let's say you had logged onto the server, the Mule service was not running, you really weren't sure why or what might have happened, right? So in this case, you could have come right into the server and ran journal CTL, journal CTL, dash XE to get details at the end of the page. And journal CTL will give you potentially a lot of information. So another parameter you can do is dash U, which will specify which unit you actually care about. So basically I'm gonna say journal CTL, tell me what system D reported when trying to start Mule and take me to the bottom of the most recent details. So we'll print this out. And what you can see here is that if we go, oops, if we go up just a little bit, there is the mule starting signal, which is what I'm looking for. So around 9.34 my time, the mule service startup signal had begun. Then inside of here, it set mule home. And you can see right here where system D reported that the timeout had failed. It failed to do the mule, failed to start the mule runtime 3.8, and then giving you some more details around system D. Finally, at the very end, it will let you know that it failed with the timeout parameter inside of here. So again, a really easy way to get some details around this process along with timestamps and things of that nature. All in all, this is System D. It, again, is a really, really easy way for you to set up these unit files to control your Mule instance. And hopefully, as you dive deeper, you'll see even more of the value in all of the amazing things you can do with resource allocation, different startup automations, and things of that nature. And also, again, just having a very consistent way to control Mule.